Severino Sir, for making this very, very interesting trip uh, over here. I think it beats uh, most of your own uh, travel uh, adventures. And I'm sure many of you have had travel adventures. Hers uh, would beat uh, most of yours, if not all of yours. Uh, I've just learned that, in fact, uh, it started with some fire alarm at the airport, and then it just escalated, went down the hill from, uh, uh, from there. So I really, really appreciate uh, the effort. Um, so as you have seen uh, in the program, we invited four keynote speakers for this uh, conference uh, who cover geographical and uh, thematic uh, depth that we thought would be of interest to the conference uh, attendees. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our first uh, keynote uh, uh, speaker, Professor uh, Severin uh, Otteser. Yes. Severin, Severin Otteser is a professor of uh, political science specializing in uh, international relations and African studies at Barnard College, uh, Columbia University. She works on uh, civil wars, uh, peace building, peacekeeping, and uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, she is the author of uh, Peace Land, Conflict Resolution and the Everyday Politics of International Intervention, and uh, The Trouble with the, the Congo, Local Violence and the Failure of uh, International uh, Peace Building. Peace Land won uh, multiple awards, including the 2016 Best Book Award of the Year and the 2015 Yale Ferguson Award from the International Studies Association. Professor Otesser has also uh, published uh, extensively dozens of art, uh, academic articles, as well as uh, more popular publications, and is a frequent uh, commentator in uh, the media. In fact, uh, my guess is that she doesn't need uh, too long of an introduction because we know her work uh, very well. Uh, Professor Otesser is uh, currently work finishing a book uh, titled On the Front Lines uh, of Peace, The Insider's Guide to Changing the World, that examines that, uh, what works in uh, uh, building peace after mass uh, violence. Her talk this uh, evening uh, draws from this uh, book. Please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Otesser. Uh, I have shared with them earlier the, uh, your adventures, so we know at least uh, you know the uh, the main uh, things that have gone through. You have gone through today. Fantastic. So let's see what's going to break down now. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much, Asher, for this very kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here. I hope you had a wonderful meal. Uh, and I hope you had a better day than mine. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, especially given the trip. But it's really a pleasure to have finally arrived. And it's a pleasure to be on time to uh, talk to you about my new book, which, as Asher was mentioning, is entitled The Front Lines of Peace, uh, An Insider's Guide to Changing the World. So the book is still a draft. And I'm in the process of revising it, uh, finalizing it for publication. So I'm eager to hear all of your ideas, suggestions, criticisms, and comments on the book so that I can make the final published version as strong and useful as possible. The Front Lines of Peace is a book about hope. It's a book about the ordinary yet extraordinary individuals and communities that have found effective ways to confront violence. And so to start, let me tell you a story about these kinds of people. It's a story that takes place in Congo in the midst of the deadliest conflict since World War II. In 2007, a little boy named Luca was kidnapped and he was forced to work for an armed group. Luca was so small at the time that he couldn't even hold a rifle. So his commanders would march him up front and they would use him as a human shield. And somehow Luca survived and after three years with the armed group, he was sent back home to his mother, Justine. But Luca had trouble assimilating. He hated school. Um, he was often hungry because his mom didn't have much money. 
And he still believed what his commanders had drilled into him, which is that the only way to survive was to use violence. And so Lucas spent his childhood running away to join militias. The only time he felt safe was when he had a gun in his hands. He was eight, and it was the only life that he knew. Meanwhile, in the United States, a young Indian-American woman called Vijaya Thakur uh, was working for various organizations focused on Congo. And Vijaya was growing very uncomfortable with the entire advocacy world. Her colleagues used the traditional top-down approach to peace building, and they relied on outsider skills and expertise. Worse yet, foreign activists ended up harming the very people that they wanted to help. Most activists at the time believed that violence in Congo was due to the illegal exploitation of natural resources like gold and diamond. So they spent their time advocating for new laws on conflict minerals. But the new legislation de deprived vulnerable people of their livelihood, and many of the newly unemployed young men decided to join armed groups as a way to survive. So whenever she traveled to Congo, Vijaya started asking ordinary people what they believed would lead to peace. And eventually, um, she decided to try something in the village where Justin and Luca were living. In partnership with local activists, she organized lengthy workshops and meetings so that the villagers could develop their own analysis of the conflicts they face and decide what kind of solutions they would want to bring to these conflicts. And after several months of discussions, the villagers themselves came up with a plan for how to build peace and prosperity in their community. And the first part of that plan was for Vijaya and her fellow activists to give out $40 each to several of the village women who used the money to, sm to start small businesses like a brick-making factory and a donut shop. Soon, uh, the businesses took off and, and the women had enough money to repay the loans. And they used the money that they reimbursed to implement the rest of the plans that the villagers had designed. So they installed taps for clean drinking waters and they rebuilt the roof of the local school. They organized training so that teachers learn how to curb ethnic tensions instead of fueling them. And eventually, they lobbied local chiefs, local authorities, and the neighboring units of the Congolese police and army for better protection and better services. And all of these changes led to major, all of these uh, developments led to major changes in the lives of the villagers. So for instance, Luca, now he had three meals a day, uh, shoes without holes, and role models who didn't use violence to survive and to gain power. And like him, all of the villagers were safer and they were healthier. And one day, Vijaya was talking with Justine and Justine kept using the word success to refer to the whole initiative. It was because Luca had turned 13 and for the first time in his life, he was speaking in the future tense. He had stopped running away all the time, uh, and he was making plans, peaceful plans, within his community. And Justin said, my son wants to hold a pencil now instead of a gun. Vijaya created the Resolve Network. And uh, the Resolve Network has used this approach to help more than 7,000 people are all people at risk of being recruited by armed groups, and actually more than half of them former combatants, like Luca. And as you know, militias have formed and reformed in Congo. The pressure to remobilize has been absolutely enormous, but not a single person who participated in the Resolve program has either gone, gone to fighting or joined armed groups. 
And to me, this, this story is really inspiring. And, and it's also very telling because there are huge differences between the way most organizations work and what Vijaya did. To start, uh, Vijaya decided to build, to build peace from the grassroots instead of focusing on leaders, elite, and capital cities. And even more importantly, Vijaya didn't come and impose her beliefs, and that way she avoided doing more harm than good. And like so many people before her, Vijaya was humble, respectful, and she put ordinary citizens in the driver's seat. And so my book suggests ways to emulate peace builders like Vijaya so that we can help individuals like Justine and Luca. People who work like Vijaya are a small minority in the aid world, but they exist. I've found them in many different organizations in very different countries. And the work that they do is incredibly important because unfortunately, there are many people who face the same kind of horrible circumstances that Justine and Vijaya were facing. One and a half billion people live under the threat of violence in nearly 50 conflict zones around the world. So peace building is a crucial task, and we all know that here. Uh, peace building is a crucial task for many states and international institutions. And by peace building, I really mean any and all actions that help promote peace before, during, and after a conflict. Today, you all know that the United Nations stationed more than 100,000 peacekeepers uh, around the globe, that it's the second largest force deployed abroad after the US military. We also know that there are many other people who work on peace, like diplomats and activists from all of the world countries, um, staff from massive international institutions, and uh, people who work for, for the hundreds of thousands of non-governmental organizations, think tanks, um, and research institutes. And uh, the statistic that I found interesting as well is that donors spend roughly $22 billion a year on peace building. And the thing is that, as we all know, our templates and techniques for approaching war and peace just don't work. Afghanistan, Congo, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, Timor-Leste, we've heard the same story many times before. There was violence, the United Nations got involved, uh, donor countries pledged millions in assistance, uh, warring parties called for ceasefires, they signed agreement, held elections, and the headlines praised peace. And then uh, a week or two later, sometime just days later, violence flared up again. Often it had never actually ended, and in many cases uh, it lasted for years after. In just the past five years, wars have spawned the worst refugee crisis since World War II. More than half of ongoing wars have already lasted for more than 20 years. Inhabitants of war-torn countries and many onlookers from the outside have grown wary of the apparent inability of governments, peacekeepers, and international institutions to end violence. And there has been plenty of discussion regarding what has gone wrong when we've tried to stop wars in the past. But I think now it's time to ask what has gone right. And it turns out that elections don't build peace and democracy itself might not be the golden ticket, at least not in the short term. Contrary to what most politicians preach, Building peace doesn't require billions in aid or massive international interventions. Instead, it often involves giving the power over to ordinary citizens. Ultimately, many successful examples of peace building in the past few years have involved innovative grassroots initiatives led by local people and at times supported by foreigners often using methods shunned by the international elite. So rather than focusing on failure and on abstract peace agreements, negotiations between government and rebel leaders, and handshakes between presidents, 
The Front Lines of Peace details the concrete, everyday actions that actually make a difference on the ground. So some of these are bizarre, some are creative, some involve age-old traditions, and some are just common sense. My book explains how peace building can actually work so that we can finally improve the lives of billions of people. And I showed that to end violence from war and address lesser conflicts at home, we have to fundamentally change the way we view and build peace. The evidence that I used to make this argument comes from 20 years of work in 11 different war zones as an activist and as a researcher and more than 800 in-depth interviews with um, politicians, peace builders, warlords, survivors, um, victims of violence, local populations, and outside observers. So here you see me conducting interviews, and here that's me conducting participant observations. And I was really happy that day. I thought, yay, I'm fitting in. I'm such a good ethnographer. Um, the thing is that uh, I'm not a man, and there were only men on this military base. And also, I felt that there was something wrong. I don't know if you can see the, bullet, the bulletproof jacket that I have on me, but I felt that there was something really wrong with it. Um, I went patrolling with the peacekeepers for several hours, and the bulletproof jacket was heavy, it was uncomfortable. Um, it didn't protect my heart or any of my vital organs. And I thought, well, that's okay, it's because I'm a woman, and I'm not that tall, and I'm not that big, so probably it's made for someone other than me. And it's only after several hours, when we were back to the base, that one of the Indian officers comes to me, and he looks at me, and he's like, huh. You know you've been wearing it backward. <laughs> anyway, I still got a lot of really good material on that day. <laughs> In the book, uh, I first tell the story of, the, of ordinary citizens, uh, grassroots activists, local leaders, and foreign interveners who have managed to make a difference in war zones. And then I describe the conventional way to build peace, which relies on government, elites, and foreign peace builders, and which I've labeled Peace Inc. And drawing on these stories, I suggest a better way for international peace builders and local elite and ordinary people to help reestablish peace in conflict zones. And the conclusion shows how residents of ostensibly uh, peaceful countries like the United States, for instance, uh, can use the lessons from the book to address lesser conflicts at home, like uh, racial, political, or religious tensions um, in, in North America or in Europe. So given that this is a scholarly audience, let me tell you a few words about the theoretical contributions of my project. To put it briefly, existing policy and scholarly research lacks analysis of what allows peace building to succeed at the subnational level. And as a result, we do not know whether and how international peace builders can help build bot local and bottom up peace after a conflict. There are two major biases in the social science research on peace building. We have a focus on failure and a focus on macro-level dynamics. We have really strong evidence on peace building failures. Um, and I've written two books about that, so I'm part of, of, this, uh, of this bias. Uh, but we know much less about peace building success. And we, do, we know even less about international contributions to peace building success. And this is quite unfortunate, because when you think about it, the obstacles to peace building are such that the most puzzling question is why international efforts sometimes succeed rather than why they fail. And here, obviously, I build on the work of Paige Fortner and Lisa Howard. And there are, of course, inquiries that look at peace building success, but the majority focus on macro level dynamics. Recent research has shown that international peace building is uh, and international interventions are critical 
to uh, enable the success of macro-level peace agreements and macro-level initiatives. But there is a huge variation in terms of findings. Depending on which scholars you follow, the rate of success of international peace efforts varies by source from 25% to 85%. And on top of that, we do not know if these macro-level findings actually are relevant for peace building at the micro level. A lot of the existing policy studies on this topic are biased, and the few scholarly studies on this topic uh, that exist, including the parts of my Peaceland book that focus on that, uh, they have all reached very different conclusions. And so that leaves us with no clear understanding of the mechanisms through which international interveners can contribute to grassroots conflict resolutions, if they can actually do that, and which international actors or actions are actually helpful on the ground. And in fact, uh, the little research that we have on the local impact of international efforts has yielded disheartening findings. Many peacekeeping and peace building initiatives fail to reach their intended goals, and many others have actually had counterproductive consequences and fueled violence. So, to sum up, what we know about international involvement in local peace building raises more questions than answer, questions that my new book tries to address. And to do that, I first tell the story of Ijwi, which is quite literally an island of peace in Congo. For the past 20 years, the deadliest conflict since World War II has raged around Ijwi, and up to 5 million people have died due to this conflict. But Ijwi itself has avoided mass violence. And to me, this is all the more surprising because the island contains all of the same preconditions for conflict that have led to violence in other parts of Congo. You have a geostrategic location, mineral resources, ethnic tensions, um, lack of state authority, extreme poverty. Uh, I could go on and on and on. And what's fascinating about Ijwi is that order comes not through police agreements, guns, and ammunition, but through local participation. The island is peaceful thanks to the active, everyday involvement of all of its citizens, including the poorest and least powerful ones. So it's not the state, the police, or the army who manage to control tensions, and it's not foreign peace builders either. It is the members of the community themselves, including ordinary people. And they have done that by uh, fostering what they call a culture of peace, huh? and by organizing in grassroots associations and local structures that help resolve conflict, and also by drawing on strong beliefs that help deter violence by both insiders and outsiders, uh, such as blood packs among most of the families of the island. Blood packs are traditional promises between two parties who agree never to hurt each other. And the story of Ijwi shows us that local community resources can build peace better than the usual elite agreement and outside interventions. And foreign peace builders can help in this process. So take, for instance, the teams of the Life and Peace Institute in Congo. LPI is a Swedish peace building organization that focuses on working at the grassroots. And they are involved in various conflict zones. And its teams in Congo have developed an approach that is based on the techniques of participatory action research. So here are the broad principles of participatory action research as applied to peace building. The LPI Congo team bases its action on in-depth local expertise. And they reject universal approaches to peace building. They rely on local employees, uh, supervised by a few foreigners. And these foreigners often have extensive pre-existing country knowledge. LPI doesn't implement programs directly. Instead, uh, it works with uh, and through 
If you handpick local organizations, and the main role of these organizations is to support people on the ground. These local organizations empower ordinary citizens to develop their own analysis of their community's conflict, to agree on the most feasible answers, and then to implement those solutions. So you see the difference with the usual way to build peace in conflict zones. In the LPI model, it's not foreigners based in headquarters and capital cities who design and implement peace building programs. Um, it's not national or provincial elites either, and it's not the state or the government. Instead, it is the members of the community themselves, including ordinary people, who conceive, design, and implement peace building programs with the help of LPI and its local partners. And so I'm going to give you a concrete example so that you can see how this works in practice. For several years, there was a. Ha, I knew so. Ah, now it's working. Okay, there was a deadly conflict. Um, there, was, there was actually a very deadly conflict in the Ruzizi Plain in uh, Eastern Congo. And it led to a lot of small and large scale fighting and a lot of deaths, a lot of suffering, and involvement from many local armed groups and from Congolese and foreign militias. And so in 2007, three Congolese organizations decided to address tensions with LPI support. And for three years, they focused on just understanding what the problem was. They organized a lot of small and large-scale meetings in which they included everyone. So they invited politicians, ordinary citizens, army officers, soldiers, rebel leaders, civil society activists, ministers, farmers, women's groups, etc. They realized progressively that the conflict was not so much a proxy war between Congo and Rwanda, as we interveners thought at the time, but rather it was a conflict between herders and farmers. Because um, cattle often destroyed crops, and so the, the farmers retaliated by killing the herders, and the families of the herders uh, reached out to local militias who went out uh, to, call, to, to kill the communities of the farmers, and so on and so forth. All of the people involved, the ordinary citizens, the combatants, etc., they all designed solutions that they thought would work to address the problems that they viewed at the root of the violence. So for instance, uh, they established routes for moving cattle with uh, little disruption to farmers. And they established mediation committees in which the representatives of both farmers and herders uh, would come in and they would mediate any problems that may arise. Because you know, with cattle, it's difficult to make sure that they stay on the right path. And so um, obviously, there were issues, there were setbacks, there were challenges. But to make us a very long story short, uh, while all of the elite negotiations and all of the elite agreements had, and all of the big conferences that interveners had organized before had never really made a difference on the ground, uh, residents saw tangible results while, once LPI and its local partners got involved. For several years, the seasonal migration of cattle took place with very little violence. Dozens of militiamen handed in their weapons, and communities that were fighting started uh, interacting, uh, working, and living together again. Uh, for instance, they started sharing the, the same market again. So outsiders can help reestablish peace. But the catch is that to really help, they can't continue acting the way they usually do. Because uh, let me tell you how my own career in international aid got started. <laughs> when I was 22, uh, right out of grad school, I got recruited uh, as um, deputy country director for Médecins du Monde, uh, doctors, without uh, doctors of the World, uh, in Kosovo. So I didn't speak Albanian or Serbo-Croatian. 
I had no knowledge of Kosovo history, politics, and culture. I actually started reading my first book about the Balkan on the flight there, and I was coming from Paris, so the flight was too short. I never finished that book. Uh, <laughs> but I got the job because I had two fancy master's degrees. Um, and I had a good training in political analysis uh, and some field experience in a variety of developing countries and post-war places. In hindsight, I feel absolutely terrible when I think about my Kosovo assistant at the time. Uh, his name was Nerim. Nerim had 20 years experience analyzing political and social issues. He had a tremendous knowledge of the local histories, politics, and cultures, and he had lived in the Balkan all his life. He was also much older and much wiser than I was, but I was the outsider, so I was the boss. And the thing is, I had never managed or supervised anyone in my life before. I was 22. So I had no idea how to deal with him. And eventually, I found a way to keep him occupied. I asked him to compile and translate clippings from the local press. And I can still see him every morning religiously posting his work on our bulletin board and none of my colleagues ever read it. Even I often didn't have the time to do so. That was such a waste of time, energy, and talent. And the thing is, it was not a stroke of good luck for me and bad luck for Nerim. It's unfortunately a typical situation for foreign peace builders. Most international interveners have no knowledge of the local policies, societies, and culture, and they don't speak the local languages. Most interveners assume that local people do not have what it takes to build peace, that they are incompetent, corrupt, and violent, um, otherwise they wouldn't be at war. And by contrast, outsiders believe that they have the required skills and expertise. And this belief is largely rooted in the hierarchy of knowledge that exists in peace building. In the eyes of most interveners, what makes a good peace builder is specialized knowledge in various topics like elections or human rights or uh, gender, and if possible, having worked in a variety of conflict zones. By contrast, the knowledge of country specialists is usually much less valued, uh, and the knowledge of local people is usually trivialized. And as a result, in virtually all aid and peace building organizations, foreigners fill the management positions and local people make up the lower level staff. Very few local people make it into leadership positions in their countries of origin. And again, the foreigners often don't speak the local languages and they often have no understanding of local politics, societies, and culture. So this all results in numerous absurd situations. And some of them are funny. Uh, imagine coordination and management meetings in which people literally can't understand each other because they don't speak the same language. <laughs> yeah. Other times, the consequences are quite disastrous. International peace interventions have led to an increase in violence in places like Afghanistan and Congo. A large part of the problem is the way we usually build peace in war zones. Western and African diplomats, United Nations peacekeepers, and the staff of most non-governmental organizations involved in conflict resolution, all of these people share a common way of seeing the world. And I was one of these people, and I shared this culture, so I know all too well how powerful it is. Most politicians, peace builders, and ordinary observers assume that only top-down intervention can end armed conflict. 
And another assumption is that all good things come together. So for instance, that uh, democracy naturally leads to peace. And that's why the standard approach to war is to work primarily with national and international elites and to focus most of our times and efforts on organizing general elections, uh, on reconstructing state bureaucracies, uh, and on designing new national policies. It's something that we see in interventions all over the world, from Afghanistan to Congo, Iraq, and Timor-Leste. Unfortunately, the standard approach to peace has many limitations and, at times, devastating consequences. The push toward rapid elections, we all know that. Uh, it fuels violence in many war and post-war countries. So, so the promotion of democracy very often ends up undermining peace. The other big issue is that in numerous war zones, many conflicts revolve around um, social, political, and economic stakes that are distinctively local. And when I, say, when I say local, I really mean at the level of the individual, the family, the clan, the community, the ethnic group. So for instance, in Congo, there is a lot of competition at the village or district level over who will be chief of the village or chief of the territory according to traditional law, and who can control the distribution of land and the exploitation of local mining sites. Local tension often results in localized fighting, say in one village or territory, and quite frequently it escalates into generalized fighting across a whole province or even sometimes across a whole nation, even at times into neighboring countries. But unfortunately, international interveners deem the resolution of local conflict an unimportant, unfamiliar, and unmanageable task. So they typically don't devote a lot of time and resources to it. And quite a few peace builders have tried, and I'm sure some of them are in the audience, quite a few peace builders have tried to change the standard approach to peace in recent years. And there has been some progress, but the majority of interveners still continue to focus on building peace from the top down, and especially on pushing for general elections. And in fact, something that keeps surprising me is the amount of hostility that I face whenever I suggest that um, diplomats and United Nations peacekeepers should consider addressing local issues. And the hostility comes from the fact that there are many people who harbor, harbor ingrained perception of what peace building should be, and that is top down with a focus on elections. And again, this is not just a Congo story. Local conflicts sustain violence in many war and post-war environments, from Afghanistan to Sudan to Timor-Leste. But international peace builders really focus on building peace from the bottom up, in addition to doing so from the top down. So international efforts keep failing to end violence on the ground, and at times they make the situation worse. So how do we change that? Well, we really need to learn from success stories instead of always focusing on challenges, failures, and issues. So these past few years, I've looked for cases of what I call surprising peace, places where everything conspires to cause violence, and yet somehow you have peace, like in each week. And I found places like that all over the world, um, from uh, Congo to Colombia, Israel and the Palestinian territories, uh, Somalia, etc. So, for instance, the inhabitants of Somaliland have also managed to create a peaceful and prosperous region in war torn Somalia. There is a really fascinating contrast between, on the one hand, Somalia which is extremely violent, has some of the highest rankings in the world's least desirable categories, uh, most corrupt country, second most failed state, etc. 
And on the, the other hand, you have this autonomous region in the north of Somalia that is called Somaliland uh, and has experienced little violence in the past 20 years, so little terrorism, and has a functioning uh, state, decent public services, and uh, even some kind of functioning democracy. And of course, there are many differences for, may, sorry, many reasons for the difference between uh, Somalia and Somaliland. But the key one is that Somaliland benefited from sustained grassroots peace building initiatives, while the usual top down outsiders led approach prevailed in the rest of Somalia. Somalilanders have built peace, and they've, they've maintained peace for close to 20 years by using bottom-up strategies and by relying on local leaders and ordinary people. And their experience shows that local peace building can make a difference, not only on a small scale, like in, like in Ijwi, but also over a large territory and a quasi-state. And I found other cases of unlikely peace uh, surprising piece all over the world. Um, and in fact, in every single country where I've researched, I found examples of ordinary citizens and local, um, and, and local elites using their personal connections to convince the leaders of surrounding armed groups to come and negotiate. So fathers, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins reached out to their family members who were fighting. Teachers went to meet their former students who had become militia leaders. Priests, pastors, uh, imams, sheikhs rallied their flocks. And traditional chiefs and village chiefs talked to their subjects so that all would support an end to the violence. These extraordinary, extraordinary individuals worked with combatants for months sometimes years, until they found solutions that satisfied all of those involved. They ensured that each agreement was implemented and continued to monitor the situation, and they tapped into their personal and professional networks whenever they needed to address emerging issues. And their efforts paid off. They succeeded in containing fighting around their villages, and promoting common interest across ethnic, political, and religious divide, at least for our time. So what we can learn from these uplifting stories, Ijwi, Somaliland, etc., Colombia, Israel, is that ordinary people and local leaders can actually promote peace. And their initiatives don't even need to be formal to make a difference. In their day-to-day -day lives, and it's something that Roger McGinty has demonstrated, and I think he's writing a book on that. Uh, uh, in their day-to-day -day lives, ordinary people often engage in actions that uh, observers view as banal and unimportant, uh, when in fact these everyday acts help reestablish relationships that can prevent local outbreaks of violence, and at times even directly deal with conflict. And so. What does it mean for us, people in the West, potential interveners, elite from our torn countries? Well, I'm not saying that we should replace the usual current top-down approach with bottom-up ones. Uh, this would be an error. It would lead to an absolute disaster because convincing governments and rebel leaders to stop fighting is absolutely crucial, of course. Instead, uh, what I am saying is that we need to promote bottom-up peace building in addition to the current top-down approach. We should elevate local peace building to equal status as the top-down strategies that we currently use to resolve conflict. And so how do we do that without falling into the same old tired relationships between outsiders and insiders that I've told you about? and without destroying local peace efforts, as interveners so often do. Well, there are role models that we can learn from. In my research, I found a lot of original 
out-of-the-box approaches by interveners who did manage to put local people in the driver's seat and to actually make a difference on the ground. There are lots of foreign peace builders who challenge the usual way of living and working that their colleagues use. And I talk about these people a lot in the book. They're named uh, Peter Van Holden, Vijaya Thakur, Banu Altumbas, James Cambury. I could go on and on. They come from all over the world and they work for very different organizations in very different countries. But they have a few things in common. They don't believe that as outsiders, uh, they know better that they have the right theory, the right skills, the right expertise, or that they have the ideal solutions to people's problems. Instead, uh, they respect local residents, they listen to them, and they're humble. They also know the local context well. They speak at least some of the local languages, and they have extensive local network. They're in it for the long run. They stay on site for years, sometimes decades. They're open-minded. They understand that other people may have a different understanding of peace, security, and development, and different priorities. They don't place themselves at the forefront of peace efforts, and they don't put their logos everywhere. Instead, uh, they maintain a low profile, and they turn the spotlight on the achievements of their local partners, local staff, local authorities, ordinary citizens. They're flexible. They keep adapting their strategies based on the result and feedback that they get uh, and uh, the way the situation evolves. And lastly, they understand that sometimes, unfortunately, uh, there are hard choices to make because all good things do not go together. So we may have to choose between worthy goals, uh, for instance, between peace and democracy or peace and justice. And the best interveners understand that they shouldn't be the ones to make these choices. The people who have to live with the consequences of a decision should be the ones making it. And by way of conclusion, there is one last thing that I want to mention. All of these ideas, all of these lessons from conflict zones, they can help us address conflicts at home, like racial, ethnic, religious, and political tensions in the United States or in France. And I'm more than happy to elaborate on that during the discussion if you're interested. I have a lot of really cool stories about that as well. But the overall point is that whether at home or abroad, we sorely need more individuals like Vijaya and Justine and like the inhabitants of Ijwi and Somaliland. We sorely need more organizations that work like Resolve and the Life and Peace Institutes and more programs that follow the basic principles that I've told you about. Because it's with individuals and organizations like these uh, that we can help the one and a half billion people who live under the threat of violence in conflict zones around the world. So all of these ideas are not magic ones. But because they take into account deeply rooted causes of conflict, they can definitely be game changers. So all of this is a very brief summary of 20 years of research and a 200-page book. Uh, and I'm, of course, uh, that my argument is, of course, much more detailed than what I've been able to tell you in a 40, 45-minute presentation. So I'd be more than happy to give you more details on any of my points during the discussion, if you're interested. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm finalizing my book. It's due to my editor at the end of the month. Uh, so if you have any feedback, suggestion, idea, or criticism, I'm going to be really thankful for them because they're going to help me finalize the book and make the published version as strong and useful as possible. Thank you so much. Mm. Okay, yeah. 
Oh, thank you. Email is s like Sam, a like Apple, number four, number three, number five, at columbia.edu. And you know you can also Google my name. The first hit should be my web page, and from there you just click email, and you get me. Thank you. I think we can take a few minutes for questions. So if people want to raise their hand, I can bring the microphone. If you have questions, raise yeah. your hand, and Aaron will pass along with. Can we take three. We'll take three questions, and then. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you for a fascinating, hopeful presentation. Part of the day today, you weren't with us, but was how, how much we're not attaining our goals as a field. And I think you, it's a wonderful conclusion to the day to see that there is hope. Um, I do wonder, uh, at the same time, about your model. There's a big emphasis on top, on a bottom up, how that shapes. But it seems that some of the conflicts uh, that we witnessed in the 90s and before were elites. Uh, changing the minds of the masses, if you will. Uh, we know a lot of uh, people in Yugoslavia or Rwanda got along quite well until they were redefined by elites as different and competing ethnic groups. So do you see any way to integrating these uh, bottom-up model into elite notions of uh, joint identity? Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. <clears throat> I, I like the example you gave of the community that spent three years trying to prepare itself. You know, and I'm just wondering, given the kind of work that uh, you see in the field, especially from where I come from, Africa, where a lot of this has been funded by external uh, donors, how receptive are they to the ideas that you've, you 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 have if you have shared with them? Because these days, we tend to have uh, donors that, in the name of accountability and so forth, one quick, verifiable resource within the shortest possible time, and they don't have the patience to wait for all these bottom-up processes that you're talking about. So how receptive are they to your, the ideas that you have uh, proposed? You know, because to go to the bottom-up round, the bottom up approach requires time, requires patience. You go at the pace of the communities. And the donors don't have the patience for that. So I'm just wondering if you have any reactions from the donor community. Thank you. One more question. Does the language of human rights have any role in the model of the bottom-up? Sabrina, I'm going to turn it back to, over to you. OK, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the second. Sorry. <coughs> My day is catching up with me. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. OK, so um, I've just started presenting the book. Uh, I, I, I started presenting it maybe a year ago, Max. Uh, I've started very slowly talking uh, about it to donors, so to USAID. I'm going to, to France, <coughs> to Paris in next week to, to present it to, to the French uh, donor community. Um, it looks so far that people are receptive in, in the sense that they're saying, oh yeah, that's a really good idea, we like it. Uh, and then they continue doing what, uh, what they've always done. Um, and but I, from from what I hear, there there are baby steps in the right direction. So there are a few donors who are experimenting now with a longer term uh, budget and longer term fund funding and much more flexible funding without the kind of you know timeline and deliverables that and and uh, six months re renewables etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I know that the Swedish uh, are apparently quite good at that. The New Zealandese government uh, is also um, uh, doing some interesting stuff. And apparently the Belgians are trying to think about it. So a few donors are actually 
thinking about it. I think it's way too early to tell whether governmental donors are going to be able to continue that trend. Uh, I know that foundations uh, have much more flexibility uh, and, uh, and foundations are, are definitely starting to think about that. Um, but so far it's really a tiny, tiny, tiny minorities of, of donor governments and, and, uh, and donors in general who are um, who are following that, uh, which means that we just need to keep working and, and keep you know, doing this kind of talk and, and, and showing evidence that this is the way to go and this is the best way to spend their money. Because the more we work on that and the more we convince them, uh, then the higher our chances th uh, that they're going to change their way of working. Um, on, the, uh, on the question of <coughs> uh, the, the role of the elite, uh, yes, uh, whether we're talking about conflict of the 90s or, or, or conflicts today, uh, even if we look here in the United States, the elite are also uh, fueling conflict and and uh, and um, and and manipulate and you know fueling violence. Uh, so we we don't have to go very far to think about that. Um, the the thing to me is the the most interesting question when 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 I look at the research, for instance, on the former Yugoslavia, which I think is the research you may have had in mind when you were asking the question. To me, the really interesting research is why do followers follow? Uh, ordinary people or. They're, they're not stupid, they're not just masses who will follow whatever they're told. So I want to understand why people follow and why, uh, and, and why they actually decide to go with the elite. Uh, and that's why I think the, the bottom up, that's why the bottom up needs to be integrated with the top down because yes, we have to continue working with the elite and doing everything that we're currently doing with the elite. But if we manage to, uh, to, to make it uh, to make it more interesting for ordinary people not to follow the appeal of the elite or to make it less palatable for ordinary people to follow the appeal of the elite, uh, then we're going to have a much higher chance of convincing the elite because they're not going to have followers. And so it's going to make their job much more difficult. So that's why I really think that the two are really important and that they work in tandem and that they absolutely have to, to be together. On um, the language of human rights, <clears throat> I... Uh, I would have to think more about it. Huh? Um, I, I didn't uh, purposefully draw on the language of human rights uh, in, in this research. Uh, on the other hand, I have a background. I've, I've taken a lot of classes in grad school and read a lot of books on, on human rights. So it may have uh, crept into the analysis without me being aware of it. Uh, um, so I would have to think much more carefully so that I can give you a, a proper answer. Okay, other questions? Maybe one last round of questions. Yeah, yeah, three. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, again, I was very encouraged by the hopeful message, but I also wanted to thank you for your candor in terms of talking about the things that you would have done differently. And I think it gives a pers you know, a, some sense of your perspective as well as how uh, these changes can be made over time. My question is actually about your research methodology. If you could speak a little bit more about that, uh, because you have these cases in disparate locations and how you came to know about those, um, as well as, um, as your, how you were able to gain insights uh, from working with people in these local contexts and, and those uh, working um, uh, on the ground. So thank you. Uh, hello, I'm to your left. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged. Left and right don't mean much to me. <laughs> um, I want to ask in the nicest possible way, I hope my question comes across as nice, but what do you mean by new? Why, what do you mean by this is a new approach to peace building? And, uh, and, uh, and I'm actually asking from a very specific location, and that's as somebody who used to work in overseas development. Because many of the arguments you're making seem incredibly familiar from the world of overseas development and many of the critiques that I think you're making could be made today of overseas development but of the success stories that you're talking about 
Yeah, I mean, that's how development work obviously is done when it's at its most beautiful as well. So, in that sense, is the, is the, is the, is the critique you're offering, is it new? And, and how much of it could we transpose from the world of overseas development? But the second thing is, is, is it new in the sense that surely we can like go back in history and probably not even that far back in history and find the kinds of things that you're advocating being done as normal. So that, that's what I mean by asking, is it, is it really new? Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Severine. You wanna respond to those questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking at my notes to see if I use the word new, because I don't think I do. Uh, I, I, I don't think that I, I claim to make a new, like a, a new thing because it's not new. We've known, I mean, we've known that, that I think that half of the people in this room has been, have been writing articles on related topics for a long time. Um, so I, I really don't think that anywhere in the book or in my presentation I, I, I say that it's new. What I say is that it's different, that uh, the approach that I'm talking about is different from the standard dominant approach. Uh, and we've known for years that the standard dominant approach doesn't work. Uh, we've all written, I mean, all. Uh, a lot of us, I'm sure, have written about that. Uh, we also have uh, talked a lot about different approaches that could work. Uh, and so I think what is new, if we want to find something new in, in the research, what is new is, um, well, is the focus on just looking at successes, uh, uh, trying to learn from successes, right, try, rather than trying to learn from failure. It's kind of new-ish. Uh, um, and it's also uh, the lessons that we learn from these successes, uh, which that, according to when I present my work to, to donors, to policy communities, etc., etc., they tell me that that is useful, that that is something absolutely concrete that they can use and that they can, uh, they can think about and that they can present to, to their higher, higher up, etc., etc. But um, I, I don't think that... Um, I mean, I don't think that the point of the book is not to make a new thing. Uh, it's more to make a, as you've seen, I've written the book as a general audience book. It's written as a book that anybody with a brain and an interest in foreign affairs can pick up and enjoy. It's based on stories. It's trying to, uh, to, to talk about research that has been going on in the peace building field, but that uh, my students tell me is often very abstract and that they, don't, uh, they can't understand very easily, and trying to make that accessible so that then people uh, who just want to read one book and have a sense of what, what how peace building could work, uh, that they can find a book that is easy to read and that is enjoyable and that give them this kind of stories and this kind of help. And that's really the, the point of the book. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm not doing the, the typical um, thing that I, that I did for my previous book. Is a, I present a new explanation for something. Um, and on the research methods, um, so how I came to, to the different countries, so the, the, some of them I had no choice. I was sent there by uh, aid organizations. So when I was to, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, and in Congo for the first time, that was uh, sent by aid organizations. Uh, then I, I was working on, on my uh, Peaceland book, and I was uh, looking at, uh, I was trying to have as much variety as possible. I was looking at failure at the time, and I was trying to have as much variety as possible. So I was looking at uh, wealthy country and poor country, as country at country with a, uh, a functioning state and country with no functioning state, democracy, no democracy big, small country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, differ, diverse geographies, et cetera, so that I had a, a rather representative samples. And so for the new research, new research, um, uh, but just new to me, uh, the, my new research was focusing on success cases because by the time I started this new project, I had um, 
15 years of work just focusing on failure. So I wanted to look mostly at cases of success. So I looked at Timor-Leste, which is a, uh, one of the uh, cases of success that people told me on, at the national level. Uh, and then I spent time in places that I, that I identified as these places of surprising peace. Um, and, and how I gained insight? Um, trying to, uh, to use ethnographic approach. So a lot of uh, in-depth interviews, uh, going back to the same people over and over, because that's how I think we get the, better, the best data. Um, when, when they start trusting us and they start saying, seeing that nothing bad happens if they talk to us. Uh, and just hanging around with people and trying to, to, to spend as much time as possible uh, actually doing the job. Uh, with the peace builder, alongside the peace builder, so going on patrols with United Nations peacekeepers or going camping with policemen or things like that, uh, and trying to, to have as many data points as possible. Uh, purely qualitative, uh, virtually no quantitative data in the book. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation for, and good luck with this uh, publication of the book that is coming up very, very uh, soon. We look forward to uh, seeing it on the shelf in Amazon. I guess nobody buys books from the shelf anymore. Uh, you've had a really interesting day to arrive here, so uh, it's double appreciated from our end that you uh, made it all the way. I know you've had a very long day and tiring day and many of you are ready to go and hang out in the pubs uh, of South Bend. If they exist, if you find them, let me know. Thank you for a very rich day and look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow morning.